At the end of this podcast, there will be a competition. Scanning for audio. Welcome once again to a Tin Dog podcast. Yes, I know show 550 has been and gone, but you know what? I like to celebrate milestones like that with an interview. And here it is. Here's the interview with James Goss. Yes, you'll know the name, but let's go and talk to him now because he's been busy at a typewriter slash word processor and produced City of Death. Now, yes, we all know that City of Death was written by Douglas Adams, but here's a chat. Hello, James. Thank you for joining me. So, you've, well, let me see, when did you actually write City of Death? Last year or the year before now? Um, I think I started in October 2014, uh, 20 and, and mm-hmm. finished on December the 25th. Ah, uh, yes, that would have been marvellous for your entire family. Yeah, it was... It, it, is, it, is Christmas ready? No, no, he's busy working. No, it was, it, it was very fun. Um, I, I think all... Th- as with all things, I think it was appropriate that City of Death had to be written quickly uh, and with the yeah. maximum disruption to all available holidays. <laughs> so, a quick question about that. Right, We all know that City of Death was written by one guy and then Douglas Adams ended up taking over. And originally it was meant to be, well, it was Gareth was meant to be writing the book. That was what was in all the Doctor Who magazines and everything. And then you ended up with the, with the gig. How did that happen? Uh, it was it was a very puzzling phone call um, where uh, basically Gareth had uh, well as you probably know uh, ITV's splendid Jekyll and Hyde series uh, mm. had had basically discovered that Gareth Roberts is a brilliant writer and I think they just went have more episodes to do and Gareth looked at the approaching final final deadline for City of Death and went oh no. Um, that's my understanding of it. Um, I mean, Gareth is, is, uh, I, I've sort of only briefly spoken to Gareth about City of Death at a party once, uh, when he went, have you handed it in? I went, yes. And he went, it can't be done. And I was like, I know. Um, but, uh, yes, uh, I think Gareth, I, I am now putting words into Gareth's mouth, um, but I think, as with all of us, you kind of look at the idea of novelising City of Death and go, no, it's not a good idea. Um, so that's that. Uh, you see, the thing is with, with City of Death, it's it's got such a strange, like you said, convoluted history. It, there's there's one guy's ideas, and then there's, there's, there's Adams turns up. And the thing is, you're standing in the shadow of Douglas Adams, and I know you've you've adapted other bits of his work as well, which I'm sure we'll talk about in a minute. But you've got, what did you, you've got, that you had the script... Because I know Sharda was was a, a labour of love that was done some time ago, but obviously not by you. But but that it's in the same vein because obviously it's it's the Adam stuff that was never released as a target novelisation. So you've got this book thing. So how do you even approach it? If you all you did was have a conversation with Gareth, so the job gets given to you and you go right. I've seen City of Death probably a couple of times. Being a Doctor Who fan, yeah, it might just live on your shelf. You might be able to quote it word for word at parties while drunk, but how do you go about adapting something? Uh, it was very, very strange uh, as a process because there, there was uh, a couple of weeks between the phone call from BBC Books going, would you like to do this? And me being able to even talk about it. Uh, so Right. So I have a very good friend called Lee Binding, who is a designer of all sorts of lovely things, but also reads everything I write uh, when he can be bothered. And I sort of spent a couple of weeks of just sort of sending him strange paragraphs that I was working on. And he'd email back and go, 
Well, out of context, this is all very well, dear, but it's a bit Douglas Adams. I I think the time for pastiche is gone. <laughs> and you're there going, well, I think I'm getting it in the right vein. And then after a while, he sort of emailed me after a couple of weeks and went, I don't think Gareth is writing City of Death anymore. Why are you sending me this stuff? And I'm going, but I really can't say. Um, and uh, it it really was very odd because you'd have an idea about a bit that you wanted to tackle and then an idea about another bit that you wanted to tackle. And you'd you'd type those out and basically send your homework off for marking. Um, and then... Then I started. So, do you have a group of people who mark your homework? No. You? Um, <coughs> on the early stage of something like this, it's just it's just Lee Binding because he is one of those people who completely lacks tact. Um, and a very useful friend to have. Yes. So, if you want notes back on something, um, he is invaluable. I remember when I had to write my first Torchwood novel in five weeks it was lee who i turned to with the finished manuscript went i think it's a bit wrong and and lee took it home and met me two days later and said here's a drink also it is a bit wrong here are all my red notes and there were a lot of red notes but it's a very helpful process when you're writing something especially like city of death where you just don't want to screw it up but you know you are going to screw it up and there are uh i think when i started properly it was sort of that that thing where you you wish you were one of those authors, um, oh, like uh, the woman whose name I've forgotten, Donna Tart, Donna Tart, who appears mm-hmm. to write a word a day and go, that was a good word. Now I'm off to be famous. Uh, and starting out on City of Death, it was very much that thing where you go, I've written a line today. I'm going to rewrite the line tomorrow. Um, working at an incredibly slow pace, and then I just went, oh, everything I do is going to be wrong. So let's just get on and have fun. Um, and after that, I just kind of relaxed <laughs> a lot, and therefore it became a lot easier than trying to labour over producing a wonderful attempt to recreate Douglas Adams' style, which really you can't do. And I tried to no, do things. I... I bought a book about particle physics for dummies, uh, and managed to read five pages of it. And when even the cartoons are too complicated, I can never actually understand all this. <laughs> Uh, so I just got on with, with trying to add he said and she said to the lines of dialogue and get out of the way. Right, so what, well, you you just had the script in front of you and you're sort of like a, a creating a, a candle, you kept dipping it in wax of text, making oh. it fatter around the writing. I <laughs> didn't think that's how you would have approached it at all. That, that's, ter- <laughs> that, that's, that's a terribly sweet and florid approach, but really I, I genuinely, I, I had... PDFs. I was sent PDFs of the original rehearsal scripts, and mm. I printed them out, and then I retyped them whilst rewatching. Uh, it was it was an odd thing where you know I I didn't actually. God, I haven't told anyone this. I didn't actually watch City of Death all the way through before I started, um, because I kind of felt I'd done that enough. Um, what I'd do is I would read the scene I had to write. And then yeah. I would watch the scene and then I'd go back to the script and just sort of type, hopefully picking up any missing lines. Somebody pointed out to me on Facebook, that there's a whole half page of uh, City of Death that's missing because I just missed a chunk when I went through, um, which is a bit awful because it's on screen, but it's not actually in the book. Uh, but oh then... no, that's that's completely Douglas Adams, isn't it? It's like every single version of the text is different. Yes, I every of... single version of Hitchhiker's Guide is different from every other version. It just makes it more realistic. That's the sort of thing you should be typing on Facebook to go. No, 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 no. I made it more realistic by forgetting something. Yeah, well, uh, you know, it's uh, what could possibly go wrong with that way of approaching it. And I think every now and then the the thing that did go wrong was I was enjoying the scene I was watching so much I'd watch another one. And then have to go back, but um, it it was a very. I mean, I'm guessing you won't be watching City of Death for a while. No, uh, I you know as as with all of us, you know we have groups of people who get together and occasionally watch City, uh, watch Doctor Who, and yeah. and somebody said, "Oh, do you want to watch City of Death?" And I just stared at them in horror, and they then <laughs> went, "Well, it's all right. We're only kidding. Should we watch the Pirate Planet?" And I just went, "Oh God, no." Um, 
you know it's it, it's it's a very very strange thing of you know there there is a whole chunk of doctor who which is forever ruined for me and unfortunately it is city of death um it's it's going to be a long time before i can watch it again because you you kind of think that you've well you've lived it yes i mean every, every single day it, it really was a thing where you know you'd wake up in the morning so excited to be doing city of death and then you'd have a break for lunch then you do more City of Death. Then in the evenings you'd reread what you'd done and rewrite it. Then you go to bed dreaming about what you're going to write the next day. Once or twice I woke up in the middle of the night to get started early, um, mm-hmm. and and it just kept on going until all of a sudden you got to the end and you went, oh, <laughs> I I've actually finished this. Um, but along the way it was you know it it was a bit strange because you keep on bumping into people at parties and they say, what are you working on at the moment? And you go, I'm. Uh, um, actually, I'm novelising City of Death, and they would just stare at you and go, oh, God, are you sure? <laughs> and, and you kind of go, I know exactly what you mean. Um, and I it- must admit, part of me was expecting there to be almost two versions of the novelization. There's the lovely, florid, incredibly good version that you've done, but also a target novelization. I mean, did it ever occur to anybody to go, Terence, could you do this? Just to get one of those nice target covers on as well. I know. I mean, this is the thing. Lee Binding is a sort of a you have finished present. Uh, did a beautiful target cover for the yes. book. Um, and it it is a very odd thing in that everybody wanted this book to exist to fill in a gap on their shelves. And mm. the version that finally does exist does not possibly fit on your neat target bookshelf. Because uh, it doesn't <laughs> look like a target book at all. Um, and I'm... I'm hoping that at some point, um, you know, BBC Books finally crack to the probably four letters of angryness that they've received and and reissue it in a beautiful, proper Target book edition that will just about fit on your shelf. Probably printed at three points so that it has the same spine width um, as those... (laughs) you, You know those glorious late... Late 1970s Terence Dix things where he wrote, woke up and just kind of went, what story am I typing today? Um, you know, those really <laughs> lovely thin ones where you're like, is that going to be 40,000 yes. words? Is it? Um, you, I, I, it's, it's not very many. <laughs> yeah, you know, I think they're the ones that I, um, I thought, oh, am I reading abilities? Come on, leaps and bounds, I can get through an entire book. And then I'd shove them on the shelf and go, hmm, perhaps not. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's... It, it's there's a very curious uh, period of of Target books where I don't know what was happening there um, because you know there's there's sort of glorious early Terence Dix, which is just this wonderful, wonderful you know a man sitting down with these scripts going, right, I have things to solve and I'm going to do this brilliantly and you know he it's it's luckily that those are the ones that I think a lot of us learned to read from. And yes. then there's this sort of strange sort of late middle period um, mm. where they they are so thin you could actually slide them under a door. Uh, <laughs> and, and you know... I mean, in all fairness, Ter- Terence is the equivalent to us, to, to a certain generation of J.K. Rowling. Without Terence, we may not have read or discovered a love of books or a passion for books on, on even remotely the same level that we did, but... You are completely right. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I still remember it's it, it's due to um, Terence Dix and Eric Saywood that I discovered Doctor Who books. Um, just one mm. glorious holiday on Porlock Weir. There was one of those... You remember those hurdy-gurdy things that they have outside shops that sell postcards? And there was one that Dude. was selling books. And I saw that there was a Doctor Who novelization of And the Visitation. And I, I bought that and I read it a dozen times, literally as a child. That's read the one with things. the pale blue cover and just the picture of um, the fifth doctor on the front, isn't yep, it? Yeah, best cover ever. Yep. Won't hear a word against it. Um, you know, hypnotically. And then the next day I walked all the way back down to Paul Ott Weir and discovered mm-hmm. And the Monster of Peladon and read that another, you know, just dozens yeah. of times going, this one is brilliant and so much, this is as exciting, if not more exciting than The Curse of Peladon, which I've been lucky enough to see thanks to you know those those glorious child baiting repeat seasons that we got back then. 
Oh um, yes, the the five faces of the Doctor. Oh, you know that that oh, glorious you're making me all melancholy. I know, <laughs> it's so exciting. I still remember that that moment in the Crotons where a tubular pipey thing emerges from the soup, and I just went, "Oh my! Oh oh, K nine is turning up." Um, <laughs> and sadly, the Crotons never never quite. You know, the Crotons is marvelous in many ways, but does not in fact feature K nine. But I was so excited because I knew something was happening. Um, oh, but yes, right. You you said something earlier that I have to pick you up on. Did you honestly write um, an entire Torchwood book in five weeks? Uh, yes, whilst having a full time job. Um, because I, I okay, that's just showing everyone up who thinks they can write. I it it was it was fear maths. Uh, to this day, Steve Tribe, the editor. Uh, insists. Oh yes, you were definitely our first choice for for this book, um, mm -hmm. but uh, it was very much sort of. I, I was rung up on holiday, and unfortunately, I was staying in a castle in Scotland um, with with of all people, Joe Lidster, whose tortured episode was going out that night. And the the reception there was no phone reception unless you lent out of a turret. Um, in this cast in Scotland, there was barely any TV reception, so we'd gone up on holiday to see Joe's episode of Torchwood, and there was some worry that we wouldn't actually be able to watch his episode of Torchwood. And I had this very strange thing where I went, "I've got all these missed calls on my mobile phone," so having to lean mm. out of a turret, and this man says, "Do you want to write a Torchwood book?" And I'm like, "Well, well, yes, I've always quite fancied writing a book." And he goes, "Oh, yes, Gary Russell said that you might be able to write one. I've got the proposal. Please start." And I went, oh, how long do I have? Do you want it by the summer? And he went, no, you've got five weeks. Off you go. Uh, and <laughs> it really was a case of I, I sort of sat down and did some maths. And went, well, if I've got five weeks and it's 50,000 words, then that's 10,000 words a week. This is actually fairly straightforward. And I sort of did it. But meanwhile, I sort of came downstairs and went, I'm writing a tortured novel. And Joe looked, looked at me and went, that's very nice for you, but can you help me retune the television so I can watch my actual episode of Torchwood? <laughs> um, so, so, so my moment of I shall be a published author was very swiftly turned to, uh, but I shall now watch Can you watch fix my, the telly? Yes. Can you fix the telly so that we can watch a proper episode of Torchwood? Okay. Well, I was about to suggest, was the castle uh, circular and were there a lot of skulls around and a strange haunted figure following you for the five weeks, thus allowing you almost an infinite amount of time to do the writing, but I'm guessing not. No, I, I, I see where you go. It did have a slightly haunted cloakroom. Uh, and, um, yes, um, yeah, it was, it was, uh, mm -hmm. me and my friend Kate and Joe Lidster and Helen Rayner, uh, and mm -hmm. Gillen Seaborn, who produced Doctor Who Confidential. It was a very, very, very strange holiday in a remote cast in Scotland, especially because Gillen was having rushes couriered to her every day. So the groundsman would have yeah. to show in this terrified motorcyclist who would just post a VHS through the door. Um, because it was the days of VHS, and then drive away. It was it was gloriously odd as a holiday. Yeah, sounds. Uh, sorry, you weren't um, in sort of some strange European um, castle near a lake, trying to recreate some sort of Frankenstein thing going on. It's like we'll all have our own thoughts on horror, and we'll all get together. It just sounds like a very odd holiday. No, we did. So that was then. Yes, that was then. Uh, now. As well as this sort of nice gig you have doing City of Death, you're also hanging around with those lovely people at Big Finish. You're the producer of Torchwood. Yes, that was that was another excitingly unexpected email. Um, uh, because it's oh God, Torchwood is just so much fun. Um, because it's it's one and of a those producer's job is not a writer's job. No, usually. No, there's, there's a lot more paperwork and spreadsheets and organising and I things. hate the paperwork. I really hate the paperwork, but I do it because it's Torchwood. Um, there have been some days recently where I've just woken up and gone, I hate this. I really hate this. Um, but the point is you do it uh, because it's Torchwood and you can't say no. Um, but oh, As we're recording this, you're, you're in season two or even three. Um, for... Oh. I think we've nearly finished season two, um, <laughs> but it, it 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 has it it was a little bit of a rush um, to start with. Um, but yes, I I remember because I I got the email saying, "Would you like to do this?" and I said yes, and I then got an email saying. 
we we were trying to get this off the ground and we commissioned a script and it exists and it turned up in my inbox and I thought, oh, it's going to be a load of old dog, isn't it? And then I opened the script up and actually the script by David Llewellyn was so very good and I went, do you know what, I think we'll see if we can actually just record this. And I rang up John Barrowman's agent and said, this project that was on the back burner, it's, you know, we, does John have any time in the next two months? And they went, oh, he's not busy for the next fortnight. Um... And so we suddenly found ourselves recording it. And and then we were able to go, oh, well, this means we can probably release it quite quickly. And by then we'd realised that we could bring the release of the others forward. And they've sold so well that Big Finish are thrilled with its success. So they said, carry on. So we're carrying on. So it, it went from being a nice little project to make six um, fairly low-budgeted audiobooks to becoming sort of quite quite nicely ambitious full cast drama that is suddenly happening uh and is is such a part of my life that if i wanted to rather than going to the library and writing things today i could just sit and do big finished tortured paperwork emails all day because the terrible thing about paperwork emails is that when you answer them people go oh you've answered your email so here's another thing and you just sit there and go oh oh god um i actually tried to go away on holiday to morocco uh in mm. january uh, just to get some writing done and I wrote 400 words and the rest of it was I'd wake up every morning and just endless paperwork horrible paperwork paperwork is so dull um, and none of us can escape paperwork and one day I'd love to do a story about how paperwork is just this monster that eventually wins and the world is just lots and lots of unanswered emails and cats <laughs> Isn't that what the entire internet will eventually be made of? Yes. Just and 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 jiggling bots that want you to click to find out that one secret of being thin and the answer to being thin is to shut your computer and go out for a walk. <laughs> the person who discovers how to write and walk at the same time will be a very rich author. Um, and thin. Yes. I, I I did have a chat with George Mann, you know, acclaimed author George Mann, and he revealed that mm. He does a lot of his writing by dictating into his iPhone whilst commuting, um, which I think left everybody at the table a bit sort of like, oh gosh, well that's a way of doing it. Wow. Um, so just the idea that by the time George Mann arrived at his office in the morning, he's already written more than anybody else could possibly manage to achieve. Is, yes, is... but unfortunately he's always got the same geek sitting next to him on the train every morning. Oh no! No, no, I wouldn't do that. Oh my God, that would be terrible. Oh, you see, nothing comes without a cost. That is such a... Oh, my God. Wow. Or do you think everybody in his train carriage just hates him? Because it's... Oh, Well, half of them will hate them, and half of them will be on the um, on Twitter giving out spoilers. Yeah, but can you imagine that? Just all these people go, oh, here he goes again. Oh, God. Uh, uh, a long time ago, when we were kids, well, when I was a kid, if you saw someone walking down the street talking to themselves, you thought, oh, I'll cross over, bit of a nutter. But now everyone's got phones. Uh, is everyone actually talking to someone? And if you've got a writer talking to themselves into a dictaphone, even worse. So, yeah, perhaps he's actually the nutter on the bus rather than the author we should all aspire to. Yeah, I, I, do, I do get that occasionally, because sometimes if I'm on a long tube journey i will just sit and do some writing because sometimes mm. that's the only way i can get away from the paperwork uh yeah and and you will just spot somebody sort of next to you just leaning over to see what you're doing you can just see them go uh unpublished author mm. and you just think <laughs> oh screw you this is very important work here that i'm typing about yeah. doctor who and romana and stuff leave me alone um <laughs> this is not fan fiction well it is but it's not yeah Leave me alone. If I wrote the, then the Doctor and Romana kissed, then you, then I would deserve that facial frown of yours. But none of that actually happens. Right. You need you need your own book jackets as your screensavers. No. Well, I I did. Um, <laughs> I still to this day haven't told my parents what I do for a living most of the time um, because it's just too embarrassing because it's not a proper job. Come out of the Doctor Who closet, seriously. No, I uh, know. It was, um, yeah, it's it's just sort of like, but you get, I just don't. I They'll think, love you anyway. They really will. I know. I just think they'd be so worried. And I'd have to say, well, I've been doing it for eight years now. And they'd be like, yes, but, but it, is there a pension? And you go, no, there isn't. But there's a lot of fun. 
And also, if I want to, I can go to Lidl for research purposes. So I'm, I'm, I'm sorted for life, Mum and Dad. <laughs> so we've got tortured running at the minute, which I must admit is perhaps the greatest bit of Big Finishness. It came as a complete surprise because for me, tortured had kind of lost its way on the TV. Um, but on audio, it's so lovely. But unlike the rest of Big Finish, this is going somewhere, bear with me. Unlike the rest of Big Finish, you've got to deal with the cast who are, well, they're kind of in work. And I know you've got Barrowman, but you're recording in the States and in the UK at the same time, which I'm guessing why is why you've got a lot of paperwork. How how can you organise that? Or is it just a nightmare? Uh, we are very lucky in that the cast all love Torchwood. And they either have very long-suffering, very helpful agents going, well, they are doing a thing, but all right, there's this afternoon they've got, or they've got John Barrowman's agent, who basically is, without John Barrowman's agent, this lovely man called Gavin, we we couldn't do it. Um, John has an impossible schedule, because he's now in ever so many American network yeah. TV shows. Uh, mm. and Gavin just has this incredible ability to just find tiny bits of John Barrowman's schedule where he should be having a nice break from filming sitting by his pool, and instead he sits in a converted garage in um, Palm Springs uh, and records Torchwood. Um, mm. You know, it's a really lovely studio in Palm Springs. They're terribly helpful, and it's the studio yeah. that John records his Magic FM show in every week, um so it was it they 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 did sort of the the studio people did very quietly ask us so um will john be recording his magic of him show and we went no 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 he's he he's he will be acting they went he's an actor as well and we explained <laughs> that he's a national institution in england and they were like oh well we just think he's this very nice man who comes in to do a radio program about old old musical hits but if you're sure he's an actor and you're like it's john barrowman um, so um, well, I must admit, after they'd been um, in the recording booth, if they'd listened to Uncanny Valley for even two minutes, they would have known the guy was an actor. I, I am just too terrified to even ask the lovely people at the studio if they were even in the room during Uncanny Valley. I've heard the outtakes from that recording, and they are ear melting because i think john was just yeah. like the stuff that made it onto the extras was bad enough but uh, yeah I, it's it, it's just that thing of for once i think john actually met his dirty talking match in stephen cree because you know you've got two men both from scotland who are mm. uninhibited and i was sent an mp3 file which is just labeled never ever ever release this to anyone and i just thought well how bad can it be oh god and it was and there were sound effects and and it was just and and apparently there were interesting picture messages being sent across i just it would just i i i don't know shall, shall we draw a line under that because <laughs> but the important point is we did john barrowman mm. playing captain jack in an exciting sex bot and you know well done, yeah. all of us. It's our finest career hour. Um, it is. To be fair, when Torchwood was first coming back, and I thought, okay, that, that's good. We've got some nice adventure. We've got the, the insular stories. We've got the, the big stuff. We've got the arcs and everything like that. We've got a load of stuff to deal with. But I was thinking, it's audio, and Torchwood was renowned for being, you know, let's call it boundary pushing. Um, how are you going to manage that on audio? And you did. And you did. I know it was it was just, it was very impressive because I was that was the one thing the one aspect I was worried about. It was uh, you know it's it's just that thing of David Llewellyn wrote a really um, soft, clever, painful script, um, mm. and you know it 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 just worked. It's easy to joke about it, but it's a very sad story and a very charming one. Uh, oh yeah, and you know the 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 one problem we did have was uh we employed this fantastic author called emma reeves who is the reigning queen of children's television but also an enormous tortured fan and unfortunately the first draft of her script our big note to her was you know this is somebody who's not been allowed to use anything that could resemble a swear word in her writing life recently 
and everything that she yeah. writes is thoroughly inspected for possible innuendo or nuance. And her first draft turned up, and you could tell that all the swear words she'd had taken off of her. She suddenly went, <laughs> Wee! Finally I can use all of these! And we had to email her back and go, Oh God, just no! Um, and it's, it is curious that um, swears and filthy things on audio seem to have much more impact. Um, yeah. And have to be treated terribly, terribly carefully. Um, but, you know, the the one big note we got from Big Finish, because we handed in Uncanny Valley thinking that, that we're, we're going to get quite an email. And the email we got was, um, oh, um, there's one scene where I think a window is open and we can hear too much bird song rather than shut. Can you, can you really look at the acoustics on this? And I'm thinking, what about the bed springs and the gasps, man? But never mind. You know, it all got signed off. It got great reviews. So, hooray. Uh, you know, I'm so proud of the whole uh, team on Torchwood and the whole Torchwood thing. Because it has just been such a giggle. And on the rare days when it's not a giggle, you go, well, we won't do that again. Um, you know, we're, we're lucky in that we've got that environment to go, well, if it's not fun, then we won't do it. Uh, so we have to keep it reasonably fun. Well, next month, you're bringing us the beginning of Series 2 of Torchwood from Big Finish. And you've got Victorian Torchwood. Yes! Is there anything you can tell us about that? Uh, well, it's an unexpected hoot. Uh, it's by Alexander Benedict, who is a really acclaimed crime novelist and her The Beauty of Murder is such a lovely, lovely book. It's so clever. Uh, from about the 30th page it does a thing that makes you go oh, wow! Um, and it's all to do with the disposing of bodies and it's so clever and such a beautiful mixture of crime, fiction and fantasy and everything. And the Victorian age is just just basically turning to this woman who's an enormous fan of Torchwood and saying, would you like to write about Victorian Torchwood with Queen Victoria and Captain Jack having an adventure? And, oh, God, it is so much fun. Because on one level, it mm. is a romp with Queen Victoria and Captain Excellent. Jack hunting for a monster, which is a really simple story. And on another mm. level, there are all these hints that go through that make you realise, oh, this is going to be very curious. Um, and uh, it's... it's so, so will there be a return to Victorian Torchwood? Oh, uh, yes. We we are setting up a whole lot of things uh, that excellent that can be followed through on because you know mm -hmm. we we got away with it with Yvonne Hartman. Everybody went, oh, you brought yeah. back Yvonne. Um, that was hilarious. I know. That was absolutely hilarious. The the uh, the setting. I mean, all right, Cardiff. You know, post industrial city. And as you, as you can hear from my accent. I'm I'm a Geordie in Cardiff and Newcastle on a Saturday night, almost indistinguishable. It just felt so real. I know it 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 was a long conversation, uh, the back and forth because you know Joe Lidster writes these these pieces of enormous heart and emotion and morals and stuff, and we went, it's Yvonne on a Saturday night. It's Yvonne on a Saturday night having things happen to her dreadfully. And BBC Worldwide kept on going, It's Yvonne on a Saturday night having things dreadful happen to her. And it's about her triumphing over all that. And you could just sense Joe going, Oh, do I have to? I want to write about battered childhoods and misery and, and clever, intense emotional stuff. And went, You'll do it anywhere along the way. And he did. Um, and it's a hoot. And being in studio with uh, Tracy Ann Oberman was just, you know... Mm. I've had so many of the happiest days of my career working on Tortured. You know, being in studio with Gareth David Lloyd, um, Skyping yeah. with John Barrowman, uh, and being in studio with Tracy Ann Oberman and just going, this is just wonderful. Being sworn at by Eve Miles and Kai Owen. Um, you know, all these gloriously naughty things that have happened to me over the last six months have just been lovely. Um, and, you know, we, we've got uh, Rowena Cooper playing a very elderly Queen Victoria who's ready to have one last adventure. And she's I was magnificent. interested in the recasting. Uh, yeah. Just, it's just uh, no disrespect to Pauline Collins, but you just... The, Rowena is, is uh, played Liz Shaw's mum in something of mine years ago, and ever since I wanted to use her, and as soon as we thought, oh, we can do Victoria, Victorian Torture, I just thought, oh, we can, we can employ Rowena Cooper again. Um, was that, was that um, Dear Meadith? Uh, uh, 
Emily Shaw. That was it. Emily, yeah. Emily Shaw. Right. Uh, and she was just so remarkable in that. And honestly, you know, if if you're listening and you have the chance to employ Rowena Cooper, do because she brings her own knitting along and she makes the green room delightful. Uh, and she's a fantastic <laughs> actress. Well, before we go, I just need to say one more thing. Um, 101 Objects, um, the history of the universe in 101 Objects, is one of my all-time favourite Doctor Who books. It just reads beautifully and is so well illustrated. I just wanted to thank you for that, because it's great. Oh, it was a lovely thing to work on, and charmingly random. Um, and the the flow chart to the Objects of Rassilon still does just about work. I think there's only one mistake in it. Uh, I do remember getting a, a phone call at 2am from the designer going, I'm really tired and I've suddenly got to the objects of Rassel and I hate you. Goodbye. Hope, I hope you enjoy <laughs> the rest of your sleep because I won't be. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that was such a lovely project to work on. Um, and who knew, who knew I got to write two coffee table books in my career. I got to write two coffee table books. That's a lovely thing to do. It certainly is. Well, I don't want to hold you up from your trip to the library or indeed throwing yourself into tortured paperwork. Thank you. I've so talked your ear off. Mr. I'm James. really sorry. I'll go now. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Bye. And that was the interview with Mr. James Goss. I just want to say that you can own a copy of City of Death. If you'd like to own a copy of the paperback of the City of Death, all you have to do is email me your name and address and I'll take care of the rest. Your name will be taken at random, and I'll pop it in the post. You have until the end of February. Be seeing you. That was the Doctor Who Tin Dog Podcast, available on iTunes, YouTube, Twitter, RSS, Vimeo, and across the internet. Doctor Who and its associated properties are all copyright and trademark of the BBC. No infringement is intended. Why not become a supporter by visiting patreon.com slash tin dog. Contact the show on tin-dog at hotmail.co.uk. The Tin Dog Podcast is a founder member of the Doctor Who Podcast Alliance. 